Now we're going to look at how to build our image dataset creation tool. We're going to build a Python program that uses our custom search engine that we set up on Google Cloud to quickly download batches of images. So we'll download 100 images at a time, and by using this script you can quickly assemble a dataset of 500 or 1000 images to train your deep learning models on. So this is a great way, a tool like this is a great way to quickly test out ideas for new models. So what we'll do first is look at a finished version just to get our head around the different pieces that we need to write, and then we'll go back to the drawing board and start from nothing and write it from the ground up. So the next thing I'm going to do is open a terminal window and run the script that downloads the images so we can see how it works. So we can go here and here, make this text bigger. And in this directory, we have some other directories in orange, and then we've got these files in blue and white and green. This GCP image downloader file is what we want to run. In order to run this, we need to activate our virtual environment, which has the packages that we need installed already, and then we can run it. So we'll source then bin activate as before, and then we will say Python3, which is the name of the Python executable. We'll run this file name, and then we want to feed it one parameter. This Q parameter is the search string that it's going to look for. So let's say spaceship. And then when we run this, we'll see it's creating a number of images in a list, is what it said. And it's telling us it's saving these images to this location. So we see 49, E94, etc. These are called unique identifiers or universally unique IDs. We'll look at how to generate these and it shows us where the picture is coming from. And now if we look at our directory again, we can see we have this new uh, directory with a UID here. And so this is where these files are being saved. So we could go and look at that file or that directory of files rather. We can go into here and we can see now these are pictures of spaceships that our search engine returned and these all look like spaceships. Um, that one, not so much. That might be an album called Spaceship or something. Um, but yeah, you can see it did pretty well in getting some pictures of spaceships. So if we change the search query to um, forest trail, let's say, then we can generate 10 images of forest trails very, very quickly. Now when we run this, um, later, we're going to be bumping the number up from 10 to 100, so you don't have to run it a whole bunch of times. But we can see if we come back in here, now we have a new directory, and then we have pictures of forest trails. So this works very quickly to generate high quality images in a data set that you can train a model on. So in order to build this tool, we need two things. First, we need to set up a custom search engine on Google Cloud Platform, and you can do this in just a couple of minutes and they have a free tier, free credit for new accounts. So if you're just signing up to GCP for the first time, you'll be able to do this for free. Even if you can't get access to the free credit that new accounts often get, uh, you can still run this program for free if you stay within the limits. I think you can run 100 queries a day, which will allow you to gather 1,000 photos or 1,000 images in a day. So it's great for prototyping and testing it out, and it's, it's rather cheap to um, do more queries. I think it's something like a dollar per thousand. And the second thing we need is our Python program. So I've got a version of it here that we ran to download the images, and here it is. And we could go through this and just read it, um, but what we're going to do instead is we'll look at it at a high level before we start programming, um, and then we'll build it from scratch rather than just reading through what's already built, because I find it's easier to understand it if you see it being built. At least that's how my brain works. Um, so we're going to quit out of this and we're going to hop over to the browser to set up our custom search engine, and then we're going to start building up our function piece by piece to go out and grab the URLs, and go out and download the images, download them and save them on the disk, and so forth. But for now, let's just set up our search engine. So if you come to this website, cloud.google.com, you can access GCP. Um, here's the $300 in free credits that I was referring to. So you might be eligible for that, and that gives you lots of room to play around with the platform and figure out what it can do. If you don't have that, you can um, still get started for free. There's no cost to start. Um, or if you already have an account, you can sign in here. So I'm going to sign in. And once you're signed in, you'll be brought to a page that looks like this with the console button up here. So we'll click that and we'll go to our console. Once you're signed in, you'll see something that looks like this. And up here, you can select your projects. So I've got this YouTube tutorial project. I'm going to leave that alone and create a new project to create this search engine. So you click Create New Project and we will call it search engine demo. And 
that's fine. We will leave it with no organization. Now what we want to do is select it. We want it to be the active project. And by clicking on it, we'll see here that it shows up here. And now what we want to do is enable a couple of APIs. So a couple of services that we want to use, specifically the custom search API. So over here, this shows you everything in Google Cloud. It's your access panel. You can type um, in here or in here. What you want to find is the API section. So down here, APIs and services and enabled APIs and services. You can also find it by typing in this bar up here and you'll see APIs and services. Make the browser text a bit bigger. So right now it shows that we have no um, APIs enabled. So we'll click this, enable APIs. And the one that we want is custom search API. And so right here, we see this result. To zoom out a bit, if we click on it, we can say enable. It takes a moment while the spinner loads to enable it. And then it will redirect us to uh, the details page. We can see under quotas um, what we pay for queries. And so under here, queries per minute is unlimited. Queries per day is 100. And then you have to pay and queries per minute per user. But with 100 queries, each query you can return up to 10 images. So as I said, we can download 1,000 images for free each day. So that's pretty nice. So once you've enabled the API, then you can start to play with it. So you click Try this API, and it will bring you to the documentation, a little tutorial. And down here, it shows you um, how to get to the programmable search engine page. So you want to click on this, and this will bring you to this page where you this is the dashboard for this tool. So if you click Get Started, it will ask you to, it'll walk you through a wizard to create your own search engine. So we're going to call this image downloader. And we want to search the entire web. We want it to be image search. And we'll turn safe search on for this tutorial. Um, we'll say I'm not a robot. And we'll click create. So now what we could do is we could embed this search engine on our page. Or we can use it as a backend tool like we're going to do. So if we click customize and it will show us some more information about our search engine. So we'll want to take note of our search engine ID and we're also going to need an API key. So if we come back to the custom search uh, API page and we can generate one easily by clicking get a key here and this will generate one for us once we select our project. So we say search engine demo and click next and it will generate a key for us and allow us to go modify it. So we now have our key. We can click show key and it will bring us to the, um, or sorry, it'll show us our key here. We can copy this and paste it or we can go to the API console and see it there. Over here, this will show us all the credentials that we've created. We could have this one here. We'll call it um, for search engine. And here's our key again. So we're going to need this for our calls. So back here in the documentation, it shows you um, that when you make an API call, you append the query parameter key equals your API key. So we'll see what that looks like in a minute. So then what we can do is we can test out our search API just using an API testing tool. We're going to use something called Insomnia, but you could use a tool called Postman. You could use any client, any program that allows you to make HTTP requests. We're going to do it with Python a little bit later on. We're also going to look at similar sorts of things with Bubble later on in the course. Um, but for now, what we're going to use is an HTTP testing tool called Insomnia. So this is insomnia.rest. Uh, I think it's a great product. I'm not affiliated with the team or the project, but uh, it's an open source uh, REST HTTP client. So uh, it's a great project. It's free. It's on all the platforms. So I encourage you to try it out. Um, Postman is an equivalent sort of tool that's probably more popular. Um, that's what most people that I've worked with have used. But um, you get all the same functionality, I think, for what matters in Insomnia. So uh, give it a try. So what we'll do is we'll open this up and we will plug in the URL for our custom search engine and we'll see what comes back. So let's jump over to the program now. Um, this is what my setup currently looks like. I've created a workspace here called Full Stack Low Code AI. Uh, if you click here, you can create workspaces and call them whatever you like. Um, I'm going to use this one here. And in here, it's sort of like a folder. You can keep different pieces uh, that you want to test together. So what we're going to do is go back to our search engine and grab the URL. So back here, if we go to programmable search engine again, um, or back on this tab, then we can see we have our public URL. And so this URL will be our endpoint. This is what we'll plug into Insomnia. And so we'll create a new request here. We'll call it get list of images um, because here in the API documentation, it tells us, uh, where are we? 
tells us here that there's only one method to invoke, and that's this list operation with a get method. So all it's going to do is return the requested search results. So that's what we're going to get back in Insomnia. So we'll paste our URL in here. And if we run this, it's going to fail because we don't have that API key. So if we do this, we see nothing returned. So what we'll do instead is attach the API key as a query parameter. So we'll come to our API key, we'll copy this, and we'll include it in our call with this syntax, key equals our API key. So here we'll say key equals this value. And now when we run it, we should get our list of images back. So if we come back here and look at our custom search engine, we can see we have a search engine ID and a public URL. So this ID is the same down here. But note that this public URL, um, if we open this, then it will show us a page with our search engine on it. So we could say trail or T grail, um, and our search engine will show up here. So we could embed this on one of our other websites. But what we want to do is programmatically return the images um, to a program, not to a browser. But in the documentation, there's a page called using REST to invoke the API, so down here. And so this tells us actually that we need a different URL. So this URL here, googleapis.com slash custom search slash v1 parameters, that's what we're going to use to call our API. So we put that in here. And then in our query section of our Insomnia tool, we can add the queries that we want to add. So we need our key, our API key. We need our CX, which is our custom search engine ID. And we need Q for the query string. So to get our API key, we can come to the API dashboard, API and services, and then credentials. Um, also, if you click here, if you click get a key, and then click show it, it will bring you to this dashboard as well. So here's this key. We're going to take this value and put it in key. And then we're going to grab our ID of our search engine, which is this. And that's going to be our ID here. And then our query string can be anything. So we could say forest mountain or something and click send. And we get back a bunch of data. So this here, this is called JSON, the structure of data. And it looks very similar to the dictionary structure that we learned in Python. Um, and what this is telling us is that we have a, a kind, a URL, template, request. We have a bunch of different things in here. Here's our query string, forest mountain. Here's a count of how many results we got back, and so forth. And so what we're going to do in the next step is we're going to parse this data into a list of URLs that we can use to download images. So if we come down a bit more, we'll see there's a link here. And so this is the page that's hosting this particular image. And then scroll down a little bit further. And we can see that our thumbnail source is here. So if we wanted to download the thumbnail, we could use this URL. Or if we wanted to use the full size image, we can use this here. So what we're going to do is pull out this source URL to download from our Python script. And we'll iterate over this loop over it 10 times. So we'll run this query 10 times for 100 images per query. So the main challenge here is getting these URLs into Python, getting this data structure into Python, and parsing it. So we just need to figure out how to reference this field or this field down here, and how to get access to that for each item in this list. So this looks pretty complicated and crazy with all these different embedded things. Um, but this is a core piece of data science and data manipulation is just figuring out how to manage structures like this. So this will be our, our major exercise for this lesson. So the way that we're going to build this is in two stages. First, we need to get a list of all the URLs that point to the pictures that we're going to download. And then second, we need to download all of those images to disk, save them on our computer. So our first step is to figure out how to get a list of URLs back from our custom search engine. To figure out what we need to do to interact with our custom search engine programmatically, we can go to the documentation. If you go to developers.google.com slash custom search slash v1 slash introduction, you'll get this page here. And this outlines how to work with your custom search engine using an API. And if you scroll to the bottom, specifically, we want to use our API via HTTP requests. So we click on using REST. So REST stands for Representational State Transfer. It's a way of designing applications that need to communicate over the network. 
or over the internet. If you're interested in learning more, this link will bring you to the Wikipedia page for REST, and you can read about the details here. What's important for us to know is that we're going to be making a GET request, a type of HTTP request, to this URL. So this is the service URL for the custom search engine service that Google provides. And we will pass this URL along with some parameters. The parameters will pass our, our API key, our search engine ID, and our search query. So the thing that you want to search for, the list or the word that you want to search for. So we'll be creating a request that looks something like this. So here's the URL, and then our key, our search engine ID, and finally the query string. So our first step is to figure out how to make an HTTP request with this information from Python. So let's do that now. The typical way to make HTTP requests in Python is by using the requests package, which is detailed here. This is a third party package that's open source that you can install into your own projects. It makes it easy to query APIs and HTTP endpoints. So we'll look at how to set that up in just a second. Uh, but I want to note before moving on that in the standard library of Python, there's a library called the urllib.request module. And this is built into Python, so you don't have to install any third-party packages. And it allows you to make HTTP requests. It's just not used as widely. It's not quite as powerful and flexible and easy to read as requests. And so even on the documentation page for this module, it recommends that you use requests. Um, for lots of cases. So that's what we're going to do. We'll use the request module, but it's helpful to know that this standard library package exists in case you're in a situation where you can't install third-party packages, or if you're just curious to see how it does things differently than requests. So back on requests, the first thing we have to do is pip install this package. So we do that from the command line or the terminal. You can also do it from the terminal embedded in your code editor, which is what we'll do. So if we open up VS Code again, and we open a new terminal. You can see down here that our virtual environment is already active. So I'm going to deactivate that. And I'm going to delete that virtual environment, create a new one, and install requests. So to do that, we use the venv module. So we say python 3-m for venv. And then we'll just name our virtual environment venv as a standard. And then we're going to activate our virtual environment. So we'll say source then bin activate. Um, depending on your operating system, your command might be a bit different if you're on Windows, for example. Um, now we can see that our virtual environment is active. And now we're going to install the requests module. So the way that we do that is by using that command that we saw here, pip install requests. And when we run this, we'll see that it's collecting the package. And now it's installed. So I'm going to close this. So now we should be able to import the request module into our project. So if we create a new file, we'll call it image downloader. Call it image downloader.py. The first thing we want to do is import the requests module. So we'll say import requests. And if we run this, we should just see no output, but no errors. So we see we run it, nothing happens. That's fine. So the next step will be to start to compose our request using those parameters and the service URL that we saw on the documentation page. So we'll go back to the documentation again, and we'll take a look at the sample they provide to figure out how to use this module. So here we see the basic usage is to import the requests module, and then requests.get will make a get request. And recall, that's the kind of request that we need to make. So we could take this line and paste it in our editor and start from there. So back in VS Code, if we paste it here, we say r equals requests.get. Now we know that this URL is not the URL we want, and we also don't want this auth object. So first what we'll do is we'll define our URL here. We'll say our URL is something, and we'll go back to Google Cloud Platform now to get the API key, the search engine ID, and the service URL, and we'll bring them into our script so that we have them as a reference. So recall we need four pieces of information to call our custom search engine. Back here on the custom search engine documentation page, you can see that we need the service URL, we need our API key, our search engine ID, and our search query. So what we're going to do is make placeholders as variables for each of these four things in our program. So here we'll just define some variables as empty variables, and then we'll fill them in once we have the information. So we'll say the URL is empty. We can say API key is empty. CX for our custom search engine ID is empty. And Q, which is our query string, is also empty. Then we can start to fill these in. 
So the service URL we know is this. And we're going to take out this parameters block here. Now note that the question mark marks the start of the parameters block in the URL. So what we're going to be doing is appending these parameters to the end of this URL when we make our request. And we'll see how that looks in just a second. Now to get our API key, we have to go to our credentials dashboard in GCP. So if you come to Google Cloud, you can type um, API and services in here, or you can type credentials and you'll be brought to this screen. If you haven't yet created a, an API key, you can do it in this way. You click create credentials, create API key, then you'll have a new API key that you can use for your custom search engine. Um, or you can use one that you've defined before by clicking show key, and we're gonna use this one. So we'll copy this and we'll paste it in our editor. There's our API key. Now we need to get our custom search engine ID, and we get that by going to the custom search engine control panel. So if you go back to the documentation for custom search engine, there's this link to control panel. You can access it this way, or you can type programmable search engine.google.com into the bar and you'll get the control panel in that way as well. So here's the search engine we defined before. And when we bring up the basic information, we can see the search engine ID is this. So we'll bring that back to our editor. And then the only other thing we need is a query string. So for now, we'll just say flower. This will be dynamic and it will depend on whatever you put in for your own searches. So now we have the information that we need. Now we have to combine it all. And just a quick note before moving on, I had accidentally deleted the double quote on the end of this URL when I was getting rid of that parameters block. So you'll wanna add that to the end if you also deleted it by mistake. So now that we have our information, we wanna compose our HTTP request. And so to do that, we need to do a couple of things. We need to replace the URL that's hard coded here. We need to turn these three variables into our payload or our parameters dictionary and pass that to the URL as well. And when we combine those two things, then we're ready to make our request. So first what we'll do is we'll delete this hard-coded URL and put URL. And so this is now going to reference this value in here. Make this a smidge bigger and close our terminal for now. And then what we'll do is we'll turn these three variables into the parameters component of our query string. So these will be tacked onto the end of our URL to tell the service what we want to do. So to figure out how to use parameters in a request, we look at the documentation for the requests module. So if we come back to this page for requests and we scroll down a bit to um, the link to read the docs, you can also go to requests.readthedocs.io. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit, there's a section here on passing parameters in URLs. So just make that a little bit bigger. It's under the quick start section and we wanna pass parameters in our URL. And the way that you do that is you create a dictionary object in Python, the key value pairs, like we looked at before, and we pass that in our params argument. So we'll create this payload structure with our three variables, and then we'll pass it to the end of our URL with this params argument. So what we'll do here is we'll say payload equals, and then we'll open and close our dictionary with these curly braces. It's also important that when we compose our parameters that we use the right key name, so the right name for our variable. So we've called it API key here, but if we go back to the docs, we can see that it's called key. So when we come back to the documentation page for using REST to invoke the API, it shows us that we want to use key as the name of our API key. We want to use CX for our search engine ID, which is what we used before, and Q for our search query. So if we come back here to our editor, we say here, we want the first value to be key. So the name of this variable, the name of this value in the dictionary is key, and its value is going to be API key, which we defined above. And then we separate this from the next key value pair using this comma. So underneath, we will use CX for our next parameter, and then we will pass CX comma. So note that these keys are double quoted strings or single quoted strings, doesn't matter which one you use, again. And then the values of the variables are not quoted. So Python will replace what's here, API key, with what's here. This is a reference to this API key variable that we defined up above. And then the last thing we wanna define is Q. So the Q 
key name is Q, and the value in this case will be Q. It will be flower. We could also just write a value in here. We could say trail or city or something, but we'll use Q. So now we've composed our payload dictionary, our parameters object. Now we just need to pass it in our call. And the way that we do that, remember, if we come back to the variable, is by passing params equals payload. So here we'll get rid of this auth section. We'll replace this and we'll say params equals payload. And so now we're ready to make our first request to our custom search engine. So what we could do is we could say print r and print out the response that comes back from this requests call. But as you'll see in a second, this isn't very informative. So if we run this, then what we'll see is this response 200. So a 200 code with an HTTP response means that you were successful. It means that you hit the endpoint that you were trying to call and you got some data back. There was no error, there was no missing resource or anything like that. So you know that your request was formatted correctly and it's calling a real endpoint, but this doesn't tell you what the response itself was. So what we want to do instead next is to print the value of the response to the screen. So the way you do that is by saying r.text and the text property on the request's response, as we can see here, is the content of the response. So you can find this if you come to the requests documentation and you look for response content in the quick start guide. It will show you here that this dot text property will return whatever the response from your HTTP request was. So coming back to our editor. So we'll run our request and then we'll look a little bit at the content that comes back. So we run it and then we'll see down here. So we'll make this larger. We'll close this so we have some more room to read. And let's just shrink this down a little bit. Now what you can see is that a lot of text came back from our request. So we have all kinds of things in this response object. And as I mentioned before, the trick is going to be to figure out how to extract this line here. Because this .png file, if we were to take this URL and paste it into our browser, then we'll see that this is a picture. So we'll come into our browser, we'll paste and go, and we'll see here is the picture that that URL points to. So the question is, how do we parse this structure to get just those lines out, just the lines that have the source for the image? That's what we'll do next. So if we go back to the documentation page for the custom search engine on GCP, on this page here, and we scroll down a bit to the query parameters link and open this up, we can see that all of the query parameters that we can pass are detailed here. So you can scroll down and see this is the list of them. So the one that we're going to use is called search type, which you can see over here, or you can scroll down to it down here. And this takes only one possible value, which is image, and this will return image specific results. If we don't pass it, then we get web pages of all kinds. But if we pass this, then we'll only get links or URLs that point specifically to an image. So we'll pass this in our editor in our call in our payload. So here, if we put search type and pass a value of image in quotes and make sure to add a comma here after the Q parameter, then when we run this, we'll see that the results are quite different. So if we expand this previous search just briefly, this is what the results of the request looks like without passing that parameter. So this is um, all websites coming back. And this is what one item looks like. So it starts with kind and it goes all the way down to, to CSE image. So we could pull this out and use this link, but if we run the query with this additional search parameter, we'll see that the output is quite a bit cleaner, easier to work with, and it just makes our jobs a bit easier. So let's do that. Let's run this now and see the difference. So if we run this and look at our output, now we see that a block goes from here to here, and there's only about 20 lines rather than about 200. And the link that we want is now this, this uh, link object. So it's at the top level of the item, which makes it a lot easier to find. And there's just a lot less to look at when you're trying to understand what's going on. And the next thing we'll look at is how to inspect this data. So what we've been doing so far is just printing out our response to the screen, just using the print statement in Python. But there are several options available to you to make this a lot easier. So you can see, for example, that in this print statement in the terminal, we can't collapse items, so we can't fold a data structure that might be deeply nested. We can't interact with it in any way. This is just a static statement. 
and we can't open it in any other programs. So we can't import it into some other program in order to manipulate it or visualize it. So let's look at some options you have for doing that. So the first thing we'll look at is what's called the Python debugger. And this is a built-in tool in Python that allows you to interrupt execution of your code at a certain point and interact with it. So it's helpful for inspecting variables, what might be stored in a particular variable, or seeing what would happen if you make a particular kind of request or manipulate some variable, stuff like that. So it's called an interactive REPL or read evaluate print loop like this. So what this means is the program will read your input and evaluate the expression and then it will print it to the screen. And then finally the L just means that this loops again and again until you decide to quit the program. So the way that you use the Python debugger is you import the module PDB and then you set a trace, a stack trace. And so the way that we do this is, let's say we wanted to stop our program right after we make our request. We can say import PDB. We can also put this import statement at the top of the file, but we're gonna put it here. It's often standard to see it written in this way, all on a single line. Normally you don't see multiple Python statements on a single line, but because of the use case of PDB, you're usually dropping it into a specific place in your script and you want to execute the trace there. This is usually how you see it written, but you could equally well write it in this, in the more standard format where you have it on two lines. So we'll leave it like this for now. Now what's going to happen when we run the program this time is it's going to stop at this line, line 17, and we'll be able to interact with our data. And before running this, I forgot to put these parentheses on the end of set trace. So this is a function that you need to add parentheses on the end to call. So if we run it now, we'll see we get our output down here. But instead of printing our response, we have this PDB shell. So let's make this a bit bigger. And now we can inspect any variables that are in memory. So for example, we have R as our response object. So if we print R, Then we see we have this response 200 as before. And if we print r.text, we have this same structure that we saw when we simply printed to the screen. So the nice thing about doing this is now we can start to inspect our data interactively and we can test hypotheses to figure out how we might extract the data that we need. So let's look at what that means. If we expand this output and look at what we have here, if you just start to scroll, you'll see there's these keywords repeating. So you have kind, title, HTML title. You see that again here, and you see it again here. So you have these blocks, which are enclosed in curly braces. So this is a dictionary in Python, and we can probably infer that this dictionary object, or this block, represents a single search result. It has a bunch of metadata, and then it has the image, and it's got a link which points to a JPEG file. So this block probably represents one image. So we can probably assume that the data is being returned to us. The list of results is being returned as a list of dictionary objects. So the first thing that we'll want to do is pull out this list of dictionaries or this list of results. So if we scroll up a little bit more until we get to the top of these blocks that start with kind here, and then we see that we have this items word here. So this is the key of a dictionary at a higher level and its entry or its value indicated by this square bracket opening here is a list. So we know that the items are a list of dictionary objects and we can test this. So if we go back to the bottom, we know that r.text is what we just printed to the screen. And if we use the Python built-in command type, it will tell us what the data type of a particular variable is. So if we say type r.text, it will tell us that it's of class string. So this whole long output is just a long string of letters and numbers. And that's not very easy to operate on. So what we want to do instead is use the JSON property of our response. So the data comes back as a string in this sort of unformatted way, with the r.txt property, but it also comes back as JSON or JavaScript object notation. And as I mentioned earlier in the data types section, this is almost identical to a Python dictionary. And we're going to be working a lot with JSON in this course. So let's look now at how you might convert a JSON response from an API into a Python dictionary, which is a more structured data type that allows you to dig into different fields and operate on different values. So the way that we would do that is if we print r.json, and JSON is a method or a function, so you have to uh, end it with parentheses here. If we print this to screen, now we see we have a very different looking structure and it's a lot harder to read this actually 
um, because the structure that we saw in the string version, which is up here, this is just a nicety that our terminal provides. And when we print it out as JSON, we get what looks more like an unstructured string. But now we can do things like figure out what the keys in this dictionary are. So for example, if we type, let's first of all extract this JSON into a simpler variable. So we could call it J, or we could call it response, JSON, or whatever you like. I'm going to call it J just because it's easier to type. So I'll say J equals R dot JSON. So I can't use J as it turns out. Uh, this is an instructive error actually. So it's saying here the jump command requires a line number. The reason it's saying that is the Python debugger has some built-in commands like N and R and J for things like next and jump. And these allow you to navigate your source code in the Python debugger. But it means that certain statements get intercepted and don't quite work, like trying to name a variable R or J, for example. So let's call it response JSON. And we'll say it's equal to R JSON. So now nothing prints to the screen, but if we type response JSON, we see we get this same structure. And so now we can call dictionary methods on this JSON object. So we can say response JSON keys, for example, and this will tell us all the top level keys in this dictionary. So we see we have kind, URL, queries, and importantly, we have items here at the end. So as we saw before, the items dictionary holds a list of response results. So if we type response JSON and then in square brackets pass this key items, then we'll get back just the items dictionary from that JSON structure. And now because this is a list, which we can check with the type method again, if we say type, then we see, yes, the uh, response JSON items is in fact a list, which means we can use list operators. So we can look at the first item in that list, for example, by saying uh, zero in square brackets. So this, now we have just a single item. And you can see this is exactly what we'd expect. We have a single search result with the link right here. And so now if we combine this key for the top level dictionary, as well as an index, in this case zero, and then finally another key to look inside this dictionary object, and we pass the link key, then, then we're extracting just a single link. And so ultimately this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to extract this piece of information for each of the results that comes back. Once we have this, then we can make an additional request to this endpoint and download this image directly. Before we do that, we need to write a little loop that iterates over our search results and extracts all of these link entries from our 10 search results for each query that we make. And then we'll concatenate 10 times 10 results. So the maximum number of results, unique results that you can return from this API is 100. So if you run the same query with the same search term twice, you'll get 100 identical results back. So there are ways around this, which we'll talk about later. But basically what we want to do is run 10 queries, get 10 images each time, concatenate those URLs into a single list, and then run an additional request for each of those URLs to download the image to disk. We'll come back to this in a few minutes, but let's look at some other options from how you, for how you can inspect your data before doing that. So the other two options we'll look at for how to inspect this data when it comes back is first we'll take the output, the JSON output, and paste it into a tool that will allow us to visualize JSON, collapse it, interact with it a little more easily. And then the second option that we'll look at is writing the output, the JSON output, to a file which you can then import somewhere else. So the first version is just a copy-paste operation. So if we were to take the value of r.txt for example, So if we copy this output from r.txt, we'll grab it all the way up to the top and right past it. So we can see here that this is the start of that JSON object. We can just copy this, then we can paste it into some other program that allows us to look at it a little bit more easily. If we create a new request here, let's just say dummy request, and into the body, we say that we're going to use JSON data. We can paste what we copied from our editor into here. And now you can see the format is a lot easier to read than what we saw in our terminal. And also importantly, we can do things like collapse blocks of text. So if we scroll up to the top of this output, we can say collapse the whole thing, or we can collapse the subsections here. And we know from before that what we actually want is this items dictionary. You can see it has 10 elements. If we expand it, then what we could do is expand we can collapse all these other elements and just focus on a single 
element. So this is nice because as you collapse things, you can visualize the tree structure or the sort of nested structure of a response a lot more easily. And so this is helpful just as a first pass to get your head around what you're getting back from an API or from an endpoint. So there are two main ways that we can do this. First, I'll show you what's considered the wrong way or the less common way, because it's easier to read and understand what's going on. And then I'll show you the more standard way that uh, is preferred. So what we need to do is basically open a file, write some data to that file, and then close it. So with the more explicit version or method one, let's make a note here, we'll say method one. Down here, we'll do method two. So method one is first we create a file. So we could say F1, or we could call it JSON file, whatever you like is equal to, and we use the open keyword in Python, which opens something on disk. It doesn't have to exist already. And then we pass it two parameters. The first is the name of the file that we want to operate on. So we give our file a name. And then the second parameter is the mode that we operate in. So by default, the mode you can see here is R, which means open the file to read it. What we want to do is pass W, which is here, for writing to the file. So what we do is first we pass our name. So we could say, um, we could say response.json, for example. That's the name of the file that we'll create. And then the mode that we're going to open it in is w. So this line here, 21, will create this file and open it. Then the next thing we want to do is write our data to this file object. So if we can use the write method on file objects. We say json file.write. And then all we need to pass to this function is the data that we want to write to our file. And so from before, we know that we want to write our text property of our response to our file. We can't use the JSON property because this is a Python dictionary and this doesn't write to files directly. But if we write the text property, that will write. So we say r.text. And then finally, we want to close this file. You don't strictly need to close your file, but if you open files and don't close them, then that memory has to remain allocated to those files. And so your programs can eventually crash or use up too much memory unnecessarily. Uh, and this is the main reason that the second option is preferred, which I'll show you in just a minute. But if we then pass the close method to this JSON file, file object, then our file will be closed and that memory will be freed. So before I run this, I'm willing to delete these files, these test files, request.json and response.json. Um, and if we come back here and run this now, we should see this response.json show up in our file list here. And we do, and if we click on it, then Visual Studio Code will open it, and we see we have the same sort of JSON structure that we had in Insomnia. And now we can do things like collapse our various dictionaries and lists and so forth. Um, and remember that when we just printed r.txt to the screen, to the terminal, we couldn't do any of this. So we can look at it in here in Visual Studio Code, or we could bring this file into our browser because most browsers have quite powerful JSON reading capabilities built in, and sometimes that's a nice way to visualize it as well. So let's look at that next. So if I go back to my browser, I can open that file that we just wrote to disk, which is here, response.json, and it looks like this. So we can see we have the same collapsing functionality here, and we can see at a glance what the structure of our data is. Now, this particular formatting is due to a plugin that I've installed called JSON Formatter, which is on the Chrome Web Store. Um, if you use this plugin, you may need to enable um, access to files rather than just websites and APIs. But even if you don't install a plugin, you can still get relatively good parsing and output. So I'll show you what that looks like if I disable this plugin. So if I disable this here and then I reload this file, we see we just get plain text output. And now you can't collapse things, you can't see syntax highlighting. So it's not quite as pleasant as the view in VS Code or with the plugin installed, but um, it still does the trick in a lot of cases. So your mileage may vary. And different browsers have different levels of support built in. So with Firefox, for example, you have something that looks like this. So by default, there's quite rich JSON formatting and manipulation abilities. So this is without any plugins installed. Um, this is probably a better option than Chrome, so depending on which browser you prefer. But uh, you can see we can do all the same things here. And then we'll cover one last bonus method that's specific to VS Code. So if you happen to be writing code in Visual Studio Code, there's another way that you can quickly inspect the values of your variables, um, similar to putting it in a JSON file. So if we come back to our file, and if you hover over these line numbers, you see there's a red dot beside the cursor. 
And what that means basically is a breakpoint. So if I click on this line, this dot goes bright red and you hover over it and you can see it's a breakpoint. Now what will happen is very similar to this line 17 here when we imported the Python debugger and set a trace. Um, but instead of opening up a Python debugging shell, it just halts execution of your program and then you can inspect it with Visual Studio Code. So if we, for example, put a breakpoint here, make this a bit bigger to show this next point. So by default, when we click this icon, it will run our Python script. But if we click this little down chevron, this arrow here, we can see we can either run our Python file or debug our Python file. And you can see when we click that, this icon changes. We get some icons up here, which are very similar to the Python debugger commands. And we see that the bar down here changes. And then we have this left menu over here. So a whole bunch of things happen when we run it in this mode. But the important point for this section of the lesson is that over here in this variables menu, if we collapse all these other ones, is we can inspect the variables that are in memory. And if we look at this list of variables here, we'll see that we don't actually have our R variable. And the reason is the breakpoint executes just before this line executes. So what we can do is click this button, which is to continue running until the next breakpoint. This icon here will run until this next breakpoint. And so R will now be, if we click this, R will then be in memory. So we click this, it will execute these next couple of lines. And now we can see over here that R is part of our variables list. And within JSON data, we can look at the structure. So if we move this out of the way a little bit and scroll down under our JSON data variable, we have our items property as we saw before. And now we have the individual items and we can collapse and expand those. So we can see here, for example, here's our link. So before moving on to the next step of writing the script, let's just quickly look at that other method for writing to files that I mentioned before. So we're going to comment out these lines here. And method two uses something called a with statement. A with statement is a kind of expression in Python that we haven't seen yet. And it's a sort of shorthand for doing common operations when you're working with files or other external resources like network drives, for example. So a with statement is an example of something called a context manager in Python. And we won't look at the details of context managers. They're a broader topic than just with statements. But if you're curious, check out this page on realpython.com with the Python with statement. This has a really great write-up on why you use this kind of statement um, as contrasted with the statement form that we used before, which is this with the open, write, and close format. Um, we're going to use this instead, this with expression as target variable, do something. So this is very abstract. So let's look at what that would look like in our program. So the way that we write this with statement is we say with, and then we're going to write the same syntax that we had here. So this exact same statement. So we say with open response.json w, and then we say as, and we pass a variable name. So it can be anything. We could say f is pretty standard in Python for file. So we can say with open this response.json in write mode as f. So f is our file object. We say f.write and then r.text. So what we're saying is while this file is open in write mode, we want to write the data of r.txt to that file. And so these two lines replace these three lines. So the file open is here and the file close, which is not explicitly represented anywhere, is executed when you finish this block. So when this with statement completes, then the file will be closed and that memory that was allocated to that file will be released back to the system. So this is how you'll normally see file operations handled with Python in the wild. So it's good to know this. We're going to be using this form in our next few steps when we start to write our loops to operate on our response data. So the next thing we'll do is look at how to extract all of the image URLs from a query just for the first 10 images and look how we would pull just that information out of our response. And I'm going to do this using the Python debugger for two main reasons. One, it's quicker to iterate on ideas and test hypotheses. And number two is, as I mentioned before, there's a quota on how many requests you can make for free each day to this custom search engine API. And if you have to run your script and run your API call every time you want to test a modification to your code, you might eat up all of your free requests for the day and then not be able to develop any further. Or you can, of course, pay for additional calls, but we want to keep it free if we can. So what we'll do is we'll run a single query. We'll figure out what syntax we need or what code we need to extract those URLs. And then we'll put that into our program. So what we'll do is first we'll clear these breakpoints and we'll re-add our PDB set trace method. 
And right now we don't need to write anything to file. So what we're gonna do is just comment, we'll delete this and this, and we'll delete this for now. And then we will comment out these two lines. And so now when we run our program, we'll be dropped into the Python debugger. Um, we don't wanna debug our Python file in Visual Studio Code. So we'll change this to run Python file. And we have our Python debugger shell. So we'll expand this, we'll close our Explorer. Now we're gonna close this shell and hide this. Now we should have our response stored in R as before. So we could print R and see that we have our response. Now note here that I can't type r.txt in the Python debugger because R is one of those reserved keywords that I mentioned before. So if we pop over to the Python documentation, uh, this is the page for the Python debugger. So it looks like this at the top. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that there are these built-in debugger commands. So any of these will get intercepted. So this format shows you, for example, that if you type H or if you type all of help, you'll get the help menu. Scroll down a little bit more and we'll see that R, R is shorthand for return, which will continue execution until the current function returns. So we can't use this R reserved letter. So just be mindful of that. We can't say R.txt and print out the value. What we could do instead is say, um, say T1 as a variable name equals R.txt. And then we see our text output here as before. Same thing if we were to say j1 equals r dot json, we would get that. So what we wanna do is that, so we'll say json data equals r dot json. And now if we print our json data whoops, to the screen, we see we have this dictionary again. And we know from before that in json data, we want to look at the items dictionary. Recall that within each item, there was this link property, like so. And this gives us our link. And this is the piece of information that we want from each item. So what we wanna do is write a loop that says for each of these 10 items in our response, just extract this piece of information and add it to a list that we're going to create, which we'll call list of URLs. So the way we could do that is we could say list of URLs and just make an empty list. And then what we wanna do is iterate over the list of results and append the link from each result into this list of URLs. And the way that we're going to do this is by entering interactive mode in the Python debugger. Because in the default Python debugger shell, you can only write single line statements. So we could write our for loop in this way, but it looks a little awkward. So we're going to enter interactive mode just by typing interact. And you can see our prompt changes. We have these three greater than signs now instead of PDB. And so now we can write more complicated statements. So what we wanna write is this for loop that extracts this link property for each item in our results list. So first of all, we could say something like items equals r.json and then extract the items. Now when we type items, we'll see we get this list which has all these dictionary objects in it. We can check that items zero, the first item in the items list is in fact one result, that's what we want. And if we were to say item zero link, we'll get the link as before. So what we wanna do is say for each of these items, extract this link and put it into this list of image URLs. So what we can say, we could first of all say for item in items, we could just print the item or we could print the item link. So let's say print item link. And if we run that command, notice we just print out these 10, these 10 links. Now note here, I have this for loop on a single line. As I said before, that's not normally how you see it. What you would normally see is, is after the colon, you would come to a new line and indent four spaces, and then you would write your next line. So we could say print item link. And now again, we see, just going to make this a bit smaller. We see we get these 10 image URLs. These are all JPEG, 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 and so forth. So now that we can pull these out with this for statement, so for each item in our items list, instead of printing it, we want to take that value and add it to our list of URLs. So if we print list of URLs to the screen, you can see it's empty. Instead, if we go back to our for loop, we say for item in items, instead of printing item link, we want to say list of URLs. So this is our 
our list object here. We want to append, we call the append list method. And what we want to append is the items link. So now if we run this, what this statement is saying is go through all of these 10 items. So the whole item up here, go through those 10 items. And for each one, append that items link property, which is this value here to our list of URLs. And when we run this for loop, we should then have just these 10 URLs in our list. So we run that. And if we type list of URLs again, you can see now we have a list, which is denoted by these square brackets. And inside are these 10 URLs. So now we've been able to extract those URLs. And so what we could do from here is we could write these 10 images to disk. But what we're going to do instead is figure out how to get the next 90 results that we can get back. And this is basically by nesting this for loop in a larger loop, a while loop, in fact. So we'll look at how to do that next. So what's important to know for this section is that each individual query that you make to the custom search engine service will return only 10 results. But the total number of results that you can return for a particular query string, like a particular term like flower or trail, the total number that you can return is 100. In order to get these 100 images, what you need to do is make 10 calls, but specify the start index for each call. So for our first query, we start at index 0, and that gives us our first 10 items from 0 to 9. For our next query, we start at index 10, and that gives us objects 10 to 19, and so forth. So what we do effectively is we make a query starting at index 0, then we add 10 to that index, and we run it again. And what we'll do is we'll run this query again and again, until we hit our target number, which is 100. So the way that we're going to do that is by using a while loop. We'll say while this variable, our counter variable, is less than 100, keep running this loop. So to write this section, we're going to move back to our code editor and get out of the Python debugger shell, because it will be a bit easier to understand what's going on if we're looking at our code rather than our code plus terminal output. So we'll close this. And we could have copied and pasted our code from our Python debugger session just so that we didn't have to repeat it, um, especially if it's particularly complicated. If you figure out a very complicated statement that you need to put into your program, it's usually a good idea to do that. Um, but we can just reproduce it here pretty quickly. So let's do that. So what we'll do is we'll initialize list of URLs as an empty list, and then we'll write our for loop. So we'll say for item in items. What we want to do is our list of URLs, we want to append and then the thing we want to append is item link. And so when we run this, then our list of URLs will be populated with those links as we saw before. And I'll comment this out for now. So our next step will be to consult the documentation for the custom search engine service to figure out what else we need to pass in our query in order to get the next 10 results. So if we come back to our browser, this is the API reference page that we looked at before to get the search type argument. If we scroll down a bit, there are two parameters that are useful to know about. One is num, or number, and this tells us how many search results to return. By default, it's 10, and that's the maximum that you can return, so we can leave that as default. We don't actually have to pass this parameter, but it's useful to know. And then the other one that we do need to pass is the start parameter. So this is the index of the first result to return. And it ex explains here in this description that you can never return more than 100 results. So now if we come back to our editor, what we want to do is come back to our payload and we want to add another parameter. And the parameter we're going to add is called start and it's going to be some number. So by default, we're going to start on index zero. That's the default if we don't pass anything and it's a fine thing to pass for now. What we want to do though is after each time we run this query and get our 10 images back, we want to increment this start value by 10. Or alternatively, what we can do is set our start value to the number of images we've already retrieved plus one. So the way that we can do this is by using a while loop. And the syntax for this looks like this. We could say while, and then some condition is true. We'll say while some condition is true, then do something. So while your condition remains true, your loop will continue to execute. So what we want to say is while our number of images is less than 100, we want to continue to run our loop. So broken out a little bit more, what that means is while we have less than 100 images, run the query, get 10 results back, append them to that list of URLs, and then run it again if we still have less than 100 images. So what we can say is while our number of images is less than 100, or another way that we could write this is instead of having a variable called number of images, we could just calculate the length of that list, this 
type list of URLs. So the list of URLs will include all the image URLs that we have, and we can determine how many elements are in it with this len, or this built-in method called len, which is short for length. And as long as this has less than 100 elements in it, the while loop will continue to run. But we could also keep it as number of images if you prefer. And then we have a statement within our loop that will update this counter, this number of images variable, uh, each time we run a query. So I'll leave it like that just to make it a little bit more explicit. So we'll say while our number of images is less than 100, we want to run our request. So let's delete this. We'll say we'll set r equal to requests again. And for each item that we get back, as before, we will take each item and append its URL to our list of URLs. And after that's done, we would have to update our counter. So we would have to say number of images. We could either add 10 to it or calculate the number of items we have with the len method, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, for the list of image URLs. This will work. Or we can just say number of images plus equals 10. So, and that says add 10 to the current value of number of images. Uh, incidentally, this plus equals, this is a shorthand for number of images equals number of images plus 10. This will give you the same result, but typically in the wild, you'll see this shorthand here, plus equals 10. And then two other things that we need to do is first we'd have to initialize this num images variable. So we could say num images equals zero. And then the other thing that we need to do is update our payload to specify what start index we want to use. So here we can say payload start. And then the value that we want to pass is whatever we passed before plus 10. So we could say equals payload start plus 10. So the problem with this is when we pass a parameter in an HTTP request, it's a string, not a number. So our payload start value is zero, but it's the string representation of zero. It's not the integer representation of it. So if we want to add whatever we have stored in payload start, if we want to add 10 to that, we first have to convert the value that's in our payload dictionary in the start value. We have to convert that to an integer. So we can do that by using the built-in int method. And so now this will say, take whatever string is in this slot, this start value, which initially will be zero, and convert it to an integer, and then add 10 to it. So then this right-hand side of the expression, whoops, this will evaluate to 10 as an integer. And then we could say, then we want to turn this integer into a string. So then we're taking this string in payload start, turning it into an integer, adding 10, and then turning the whole thing into a string. So this is kind of an ugly representation with this nested data type conversions. So something that looks a little bit nicer is to get rid of this number of images variable and just use the integer value that comes back from calculating the length of our list, as we mentioned before. So I'll change this here. I'll say we'll delete number of images. We'll say len list of URLs. So now we're going to say while our list of URLs is less than 100, then keep running our while loop. And then what we can do down here is instead of using the previous value in payload start, we can just figure out how many images we currently have. Say we have 10 images. The next loop, we want to start on image number 11. So what we could do instead is say, I want to take the length of the list of URLs as before and add one, and then wrap this expression in a string conversion. So now we're saying take the length of the list oh, that's holding our URLs and add one to it. So in this case, if we have our first 10 images, then this value will be 10, and then we'll add one, and then get 11. And then we wanna convert the number representation of 11 into a string. So our payload start will be 11 for the next call. And then we can get rid of this as well. And so now we're almost ready to test this, but I made a mistake here. I said for item and items, but we haven't defined items anywhere. So if I run this now, we're gonna get an error. So I can see down here, Sam's name items is not defined. So before we had said items equals r.json and then items like this. And so we could have this statement. This would work as long as it's in our while loop. This will work. So then each time you run your, your HTTP request, you're setting items to a new value, which is whatever came back in your request. It would have to be down here. But what we could do instead is just replace items here with this value. So if we get rid of items here, and we get rid of it here, and then we want to 
cut this and paste it here. Then we say for each item in this, which is the items that come back from our request, append its link value. So this will work. And then the other thing we want to do before running our test is we're currently running this loop until we hit 100 images. That's unnecessary for testing, so we're going to change this to 20. We can be pretty confident that if it works to get 20 images, it'll work to get 100. But we don't want to burn through all of our free requests with this service. So let's change this 100 to 20. And then after our while loop, we want to print out the number of URLs that we have, as well as the URLs themselves. So if we say print list of URLs, and then we also want to print the length of that list to see at a glance how many we have, we should now see a block of 20 URLs as well as the number 20 that shows us that we in fact collected 20 URLs. So if we run this now, there's our 20. Let's expand this a bit. There's the number 20. And here are the 20 URLs that came back. And if we were to bump that number up to 100, then we would have 100 URLs. So now we've got the larger loop that allows us to collect up to 100 images. The next step is to actually go and download these images. So in order to download our images, what we're going to do is write another for loop that iterates over the list of URLs that we've collected and make an HTTP request to retrieve the content of each of those URLs and then write it to disk. And it's quite straightforward to do this. So what we're going to do after our while loop is we're going to say for each URL in our list of URLs, what we want to do just in comment form, first of all, is we want to um, make an HTTP request to the URL and then save the content of that request to disk. So first of all, we've already seen how to use requests to make an HTTP request. So we can copy this line and bring it down here. And we could set it to R again. Let's leave it as R for now. We'll say request.get, and we're going to be using this URL here. And we don't need to pass any parameters. So we're just request.get and then the URL. And so this will come back as a response object again, but we actually want the content of that response. So with our text responses from before, we had our text property and our JSON method that we could use to inspect our JSON data. But what we want to do is grab the raw content of this response. And so we'll say image equals r.content. And so you can see what the methods are on these responses. Again, if you use the IntelliSense autocomplete, we have this content property. And if we hover over it, we'll see it's the content of the response in bytes or in binary. And so that's what we want to write to our file in the next step. So then our next step is to take this with block that we wrote before and modify it a little bit to save the contents to disk. So the first thing that we have to decide is what to call the file. So if we call the file response.json, first of all, this is the wrong extension for an image file, but that's a separate issue. If we do this, then each time we save a new image, it's going to overwrite the previous image as response.json. So what we need to do is give each file a unique file name. So there are a couple of ways that we could do this. We could assign a random file name or we could compose a file name with some information we know about our query. So for example, we could say trail-1.jpg, trail-2.jpg. And so I'll show you how to do both. First, we'll look at creating a random file name using the UUID or universally unique identifier package within Python. This creates a random string of letters and numbers for uniquely identifying resources. So it's a handy way to generate unique file names. And then second, I'll show you how you can compose a file name with that information I mentioned. So let's bring up a terminal just to look at how we would use UUID. So if we enter the Python REPL, we can import the UUID module. And the UUID module has a method called UUID4. And if we run this, then we get this back. So we see this 2C32. Each time we run it, we get a different value. And so this gives us 32 alphanumeric characters plus our four dashes and they're in the UUID format. So we actually want to convert this to a string to use it for a file name. So if we run this command, then we see we get this string value. So what we can do is just call our image this.jpg or this.png, and that will work. So if we come back to our code, go back to the top of our file and import UUID. And then here, we'll say file name equals UUID.UUID4, wrapped in the string conversion method and then we need to append an extension. Now, we don't know the extension yet. We'll do this in a later step, but we need to give some image extension to the file. So let's just say .jpg for now, because inspecting our URLs before, we saw that we were getting mostly JPEGs back. So we would say plus .jpg. So now we've composed our file name, and so now we can pass that as our first argument here. We can say with open file name, 
So this will be that long sequence of numbers and letters, .jpg. And we want to open it not in write mode, but in write binary mode. So this B flag tells the open method that we're going to be operating with binary data instead of text data. So previously we were looking at JSON, so the W flag was enough. We just wanted to write text data to a file. But with binary data, you have to pass this B flag. And then we can leave this as F as before, our file object. And now what we want to write to our file is our dot content, so our image data here. So if we change this to image and then run it, and we should get all of our images downloaded and saved to disk. Now before doing this, what I'm going to do is change this 20 to back to 10 for now, just to download 10 images and run it and see what happens. So we run it, we see the output as before, and then we see over here in our file list that we have a bunch of images now. So if we click on this, there's a flower, there's some more flowers, so that's working fine. Now a different way that we could do this instead of using random file names is we can get rid of UUID and we can get rid of this. And what we want to do instead, we can leave this the same, is we want to say combine our query string, so flower in this case, with the number of the URL in the list. So for example, flower-1, flower-2. The way that we can do this is we can keep track of the index of the item that we're looping over by using a method called enumerate in Python. And so I'll bring up a terminal just to show you what that enumerate method looks like. So if we bring up the REPL again. So let's say we have a list of names. Let's see names equals Bob, Alice, and Carol. So this is our list of names. So now in a typical for loop, we would write name in names, and then we want to print the name. And so this will give us our names. But if we run enumerate on our names, then we actually get two values back. We don't just get the name, but we also get the index. And that comes back like this. So we can say for index name. Now notice these variables could be anything. This could be I and N, or it could be count and person or whatever. We'll say for index name in enumerate names like this. Then we can say print the index and the name. And now we see we have index zero for Bob, index one for Alice, and index two for Carol. So using the same logic, we can iterate over our list of URLs and append the index of that image to the file name. So if we close this, we come back to here. Now what we want to do is say for index and URL in enumerate list of URLs, then what we'll do here is we'll set our file name to this composed string. So we'll make an F string as we saw before. The first value will be our index. That'll be the number zero, number one, whatever, and then a dash. And then we'll pass the query value, the string that we're searching for, which we can get from our payload. So payload Q, we recall, was our query string. And then we need to add our file extension, so .jpg. And that's it. So now we'll have zero dash flower dot jpeg and before we run this note that our text here is red our text here is red and we've got this red squiggly uh, these are all the same thing these are telling us that we have a syntax error when the problem is we're using single quotes here inside a single quoted f string and so the interpreter will read up to here and then the string looks incomplete so this single quote actually has to be a double quote in order for this f string to be formatted correctly and so now if we run this we'll see over here, now we have zero flower, one flower, two flower, three flower, and so forth. So you might prefer this style of naming. You might prefer the unique identifiers. Uh, it's up to you. I'll leave the enumerate method here for now because it's a bit easier to see at a glance what search query you were using when you, when you downloaded that image. So now you have everything you need to generate an image data set using your custom search engine. There are, however, lots of improvements you could make to this program to make it easier to read and write and maintain, easier to work with, and so forth. And so what we'll do next is we'll go over some of the things that you could do to improve this program, but consider these optional improvements. You don't need them for the functionality of using your custom search engine, but internalizing these concepts will help you write better Python programs. We're going to cover lots of these topics going forward as well later in the course when we're writing APIs and doing some of our model training. But we'll cover them briefly now, just sort of an overview, in, in case you're curious about some improvements you can make. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is delete these flower images. And now I'm going to open up this GCP image downloader file. So this program operates essentially the same as our image downloader that we built here. But it includes some additional niceties in the way that it runs, and it allows the user to interact with it. And so let's go through some of those now. So I'm going to close these terminals, and I'll close the file explorer. 
and I'll shrink this text just a little bit. So first we'll just glance at the file in overview. So first notice we have several more packages imported here than in our image downloader. Then we have a block comment here that tells us what this program is doing. So it says it's a script to download images using GCP search engine and so forth. Here's the steps for running it. Here's the reference API call and so forth. Then if we look a bit further down, we can see that this file is structured as a bunch of functions. So this def statement defines a function. So for example, here we're defining a function called get images. Here we're defining a function called save image and so forth. And the primary reason you define functions in your code is to make that code more reusable. So if you need to call, say, this get images method in various parts of your program, then it's easier to have it in one place. If you need to change it or if you need to consult it, it's in one place rather than having that code copied and pasted to different parts of your code base. So structuring your code in functions, and later we'll talk about objects as well, but structuring it in terms of functions makes it much easier to, to read and evaluate. And we'll talk lots more about defining functions and using functions later in the course, but for now just know that the syntax is pretty straightforward to create a function. You have this def keyword, then the name of your function, so you call it whatever you like, function one, and then open and close parentheses. And if you want to pass any parameters or any arguments to your function, you pass them in here. So for example, in our save image function, you can see that we pass two parameters, an image and then the extension of the image. So here we could pass name and age or whatever the case may be. And then under here, you have your statements. So you could print, say age, say it takes age as it's, maybe this function is called double age. And what it does is it takes an age and it returns or sends back the age times two. And so this could be a simple function. You pass in an age and then you return twice the value of that age. And we'll talk lots more about creating and using functions later in the course. Then at the bottom, we have this if name equals main block. Uh, this is a standard syntax in Python. And this block is saying that if you run this file directly, then do these steps. So the first thing it's doing is it's setting up an argument parser. So what this does is it allows the user to pass a parameter on the command line which in this case will be the queue parameter. And this will tell the program what to use for the query string. So this queue gets put into our payload as the queue parameter. And the reason it's helpful to structure it this way is we could open our directory and activate our virtual environment. And then we can call our program by passing this dash Q flag. So here we'll pass dash restaurant. And if we run it, it's going to download uh, some images of restaurants, which we'll see here in a second. And we open our directory, then we can see here we've got these various images of restaurants. And then if we want to change our search term to something else, like sailboat, and we run it again, and we can open up our directory again, and here we'll see we have now pictures of sailboats. So the nice thing about having this argument parser is that you can run your program again and again without having to come in and change the text in your source code. So this just makes it a bit more flexible to use. And then the last thing I'll talk about are some error checking and sort of robustness measures. Here we have a function called getext for get extension. And what this does is figures out whether we're grabbing a JPEG file or a PNG file or not an image file at all. And then we set the extension of the file that we'll be saving to disk by using this method. Then another thing that we do is we have this make dir function or make directory. And all this does is creates a random directory using that same UUID package that we used for file names. It creates a directory with a random name on disk. And so if we go back, into where we were running before, we can see these are the directories up here. When we called our program, it created these directories for us. And so this is a great way to separate your downloads. If you're running several downloads, they don't all get bucketed together. So this sort of thing comes in handy if you want to create a data set with different labels. So for example, we use sweaters, coats, and dresses as different labels for the data that we'll be using to train our model. And so by doing it this way, each query gets its own directory and you can keep the files together more easily. And then one last thing to note is we pass this timeout parameter to our request. So this download image is the main call to get our image content. We're passing this timeout argument of six seconds. And this is saying if after six seconds we don't get an image back, just abort this request. Because sometimes you'll make a request and an image has moved or been deleted and your program will hang forever at that point. So if we set a timeout, then if we find a missing image, we'll just move on to the next one after six seconds. And then lastly, we're using something called type hinting. So this line here, line five, imports a package in Python called typing. And what this allows us to do is within our program, we can specify the data type of a particular variable when we create it. 
So down here, for example, we have this get URLs method, and it takes one argument, which is Q, and we can see here that it's of type string, and by default, we set it to flower. And so Python is what's called a dynamically typed language, so you don't have to specify that it's a string. When Python tries to run your program, it will try to figure out what kind of data Q is based on what you're doing with it. But when you're reading code, or if you'd like to do something called static analysis, which is analyze your program without running it, then it's helpful to have these type hints. So here's another one. We're saying image URLs is going to be a list filled with string objects. If we come down here, payload is going to be a dictionary. And then payload here, payload start, so this key within start, the value will be a string. So this just makes it a bit easier to understand what's going on in your code. We're not going to be covering type hinting in this course because it's not strictly necessary and it's a bit contentious. Some people like it, some people don't, but hopefully this provides a bit of a pointer if you're curious um, to look up type hinting and the typing package in Python. So that's all we'll talk about for improvements that you could make to your program. And as we learn more about Python, you'll figure out other ways that you can improve your program as well. And so now your assignment for this module is to create a program like this one that will allow you to go query your custom search engine and build your data set. And once you've collected your data, I'd encourage you to share it with other members in the class, maybe in the study forum or elsewhere. And this will give us some early indications of what people are interested in, what people are building. And I'm very curious to see what you guys are working on.